Let's talk some footy. And Footy Classified was part of the build-up to this story last week. Gary Rowan was getting lots of discussion. Yeah. Chris Scott was here, where, where Sam is. And he had a robust discussion with him about Gary Rowan. And this is how it unfolded from there. Is there nervousness around Gary Rowan, who hasn't always stood up in finals? Yeah, I don't subscribe to that. We think he's a great foil for Hawkins and Cameron. He's a difficult match-up if the opposition um, give him too much space. And his pressure's elite. But I, mean, I think it's borderline silliness to highlight a player who none of you would have in the top 15 players in our team and say, he's the one under the most pressure. High ball forward, Rowan! Good leap at the footy! Second. It's gone right through the middle. Big pack forms. Oh, Rowan! Marked it like Wayne Carey. Pretty good looking here, but how about that, that kick? The cats are back in front. But he's, look at his gratifying. I don't mind saying that. We are really clear on what he can bring to our team and, and the way we play. He's absolutely an energy giver. Um, his teammates love playing with him, and I'm just really proud of him today. Sam, I'm fascinated to hear whether you saw the comments on Monday night, whether you think Gary Rowan is in or outside Geelong's top 15, and what you thought of his coach's management of him. Well, I think yeah, you can't help but have respect for his coach going into bat for the player. Uh, you know, despite some evidence over the journey that perhaps he... Um, from the outside world hasn't been a highly regarded. I think inside that football club, they obviously respect an enormous amount what what he has produced. And if you look at some of the players that they left out, you know they left out Parfit, who's had 28 touches the last couple of games of the season, and they play and they play go wrong. I don't think there's any any suggestion that he's not in their best side, or in in particular in their most important players. And I think as a coach, having a player who's an energy giver. As, as Scotty mentioned then, I think that can't be underestimated in big games. Sam, watching that final, Geelong and Collingwood, do you sit back as the Hawthorne coach and ask yourself, how far off are we from getting to that mark of playing that, that high standard of footy? Yeah, not just that game, yeah. to be fair. I think all of the games on the weekend, I'm sure every coach of the teams outside the finals said, um, look at this, this is a, a step above what we're capable of right now. And, um, you know... I think the consistency of which it was produced, sometimes you see them for 10 minutes and there's this heat in the game, but for almost 120 minutes of every game, there was, there was heat on the ball. And I think um, certainly I was like most of the other coaches and thought we got some, we got some work to do to play at this level. More on Chris Scott. And first of all, just extraordinary. How, as good as Gary Rowan was, nine coaches' votes to Jeremy Cameron's one. I'm sorry, I just don't agree with that. But um, not everybody loved his player management all of the time. This was Patrick Dangerfield on starting on the bench. It's sort of been the, the role after the, the last few weeks to try and keep speed on the game. Um, wasn't super pleased all game with it. <laughs> Drowdy, I might have to have a chat to Grigger this week. But um, all, all's well that ends well. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? So you look at that, the start of every quarter, eight minutes in the first, six minutes, eight minutes. And when the game was on the line at three-quarter time, he and Selwood, uh, you know, have started, oh, sorry, Selwood started the, the second half on the bench, but uh, not the last quarter, Sam. But it's a big move. You wouldn't see Lockie Neal starting any games on the bench. No, I think the way they've managed their players this year is um, being two games clear on top, they've been able to manage players really smartly through the year. And I thought Selwood's centre bounce work in particular as the game went on was outstanding. And obviously an older player starting on the bench, wait till a little bit of sting comes out and then come on and have such a significant impact like Selwood did, um, who got into the coaches' votes as well. So I think it certainly worked on, on Selwood's part. Collingwood were magnificent, it must be said. They were gallant and their, their day will come again. But some of the key... Uh, superstar forwards probably didn't have their best night. Yeah, that's right, Hutchie. Yeah, I thought they were brilliant in the, what they did. Could easily have won the game. But Jamie Elliott, just the eight touches, uh, one goal. So just didn't get enough out of him. Ginnivan's a really interesting one. Uh, he had the nine touches, didn't hit the scoreboard. And Hoskin Elliott was the other player under the spotlight who just dropped some marks that he should have taken. Like this one. This one at, at the critical time. Just lacking a little bit of confidence there. So they need more out of them against the Fremantle Dockers who got so much out of their small forwards on Saturday night. You love a creative player. Uh, Nick Dacos, what's he bring to footy at the moment? And he's 
weekend game was fascinating too, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I look at him and I'm trying to find holes in what he produces. And in the first couple of minutes, I thought, OK, he's human. Uh, I watched his first couple of moments. He had a nervous free kick. Uh, and then he, he gets run down. Um, and I thought to myself at this point, still three minutes into the game, OK, maybe this occasion is too big for the young fella, which you would understand in his first year playing in front of that crowd. And he hasn't been flustered at all for the whole season. But unfortunately, these two edits in the last quarter show a level of composure that other than, other than Scott Pendlebury, I don't think anyone on the field produced in this field, in this game. Is he the most exciting him. kid you've seen come through in a long, long time? Oh, I think there's a lot of... I don't think exciting is the word I would use. I think he's the most reliable kid. He's got some talents and he's got some X factor about him, but his level of consistency... I mean, his worst game for the season, he's still in their best 10 or 12 players. Who's the last first-year player you think, Sam, who's had this impact? Can you remember like, who it would be? Oh, the, the players that are producing that level of consistency, I think you're going back a long time. Yeah. The, the Hazelby type of mm. player and the, you know, the Judds. Judd, and and the, the players who produce such a high level in their first year is not... Not, not the usual. I'm sure you deal with a lot of parents at Hawthorne, a lot of fathers. I'm sure you don't have a father like Peter Dacos. He was fascinating on the weekend talking about his other son and where he was played by his former coach. Well, I think uh, firstly when he, he went in, he played that high half forward role, which I, I think is a killer for any career. Was yeah. it frustrating for him? It was frustrating for him and for me because I just felt his skill sets weren't it wasn't giving him the opportunity to put those to good use, read the team, and then, then for him to, to flourish and, and develop as a player. Oh, he was unashamed that he has spent hours and hours and hours of days and weeks with both his boys, the hand-eye stuff, the, the foot stuff. It was just fascinating Listen to the work he's put in and his disdain for, the, really, the way his elder son was played up until now. What about the, when, when you have a change like that? Because he has been transformed, Josh Dacos, hasn't he, this year? Yeah, he's played some amazing football. I think you have to acknowledge that every, every son um, is, is the shining light of their, of their father and, in particular, their mother as well. So, is um, High Half Ford a career killer? <laughs> well, I mean, it is, I think it's probably the most difficult position to play consistently well, but it's also the foot-in-the-door position where um, you learn a lot as a High Half Forward about how to ha make an influence, and then when you move around after that, quite often you do blossom. Not without some challenges, the Cats, and we'll move to the Pies and the other clubs in a moment, but the Geelong Ruck situation is going to be interesting. He didn't have a good game, Reece Stanley, to be fair, and I'll get your thoughts here, Sam, on Blixarves and his use late as well. Uh, Blixarves on Dugowie didn't work either. So the start of the last quarter, that's Stanley's last ruck work for the game. And then they make the switch. What do you think this was? Was it Cox related? Was it form related? Um, what, was, what was your view on the, the decision making? Well, I, I, I did notice late in the game they have their second ruck or Blitzavs um, is one of the best players in the competition. In, in my view, they had him in the centre bounces with the game on the line a minute to go. Um, and, it, and there was a part of me that thought um, that that was an interesting call. I mean, he's the fittest player and they obviously wanted the extra, the extra run on the ground. But having your, having your dominant ruckman on the bench for he, a large portion is, is, it was interesting, I does thought. Does he fear his position in the pre Wait, Segler got 28 uh, in the last game. It's a bold move. Uh, Segler's played what, two games for the year. Reese has played 22, 23. So I'd take the hard and Reese Stanley still to, to the prelim. 